we have with us today, Kristen and Lindsay. So why don't we just start with introductions? If um, Kristen, we could start with you, you know, just uh, share with us where you work and what your role is within the company. I think we might have a little bit of a delay. So um, Lindsay, why don't you kick us off with introducing yourself? Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Friedman LLP. We are based out of New York City with offices throughout New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And I've been with the firm for about 11 years now. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I believe we're going to try and get Kristen back on the line, but um, you know, I'll just quickly, a lot of you know Kristen, she can reintroduce herself, but she is um, a very active PICPA member, as well as um, the Director of Talent Acquisition at Kreischer Miller. Kreischer Miller um, is uh, a supporter as well as Friedman of the PA CPA Foundation. So I thank both of you um, and, and the firm and company. But Lindsay, if you could share with us, um, you know, how are you going to recruit this fall? If you could share how that plan looks for you this year? Absolutely. So myself with my recruiting team have been spending a lot of time focusing on this. You know, summer is usually a time when we start to plan for fall campus recruiting as it is. And we've been trying to come up and develop our own plans simultaneously with the schools making their decisions about what they're going to do. And so they're really an intertwined decision between the firm and the schools. But what we're really looking at right now is 100% virtual events. Because we're virtual and we don't have to travel, we're actually hoping to increase our presence with the students, even though it would be remote, just because we'll have a little bit more time and availability to do so. So whether that be in presentations, virtual career fairs, we are pushing some of the accounting societies to do panel events like this, but geared towards the students, whether it be they can do big four panels, mid-sized panels on specific topics. And then as we roll into the actual interviewing process, uh, we are looking at changing the way we're going to do our interviews. So, you know, as most Firms do, we used to do on-campus interviews for first round and then super days for second round in the office. We're probably gonna look at consolidating that into one super day um, and, and narrowing it down to really a one round of interview. Uh, but we are also looking at some ways to ensure that these students aren't losing the opportunity to get the, the sight and the feel of our culture as a firm. And so we're looking at things like creating virtual tours, um, maybe buddy setups between the person doing the interview once they get to that point in the process and a Friedman employee so that they can really, almost like a pen pal program, so that they can really get to know Friedman and our organization before making a decision. Great, thank you. Kristen, I pseudo introduced you. <laughs> and uh, everyone knows exactly who you are and where you work, but if you could share with us your recruitment plan for the fall. Sure, I would say it's a lot similar to Lindsay's in that we're shifting to the virtual environment. Um, and I, I'll tell you that had you asked me a year ago if I was a fan of that, I would have said absolutely not. Um, I need the that in-person experience. And um, I've been pleasantly surprised that you still can show your personality and make a, a strong connection with someone. So I'm. I'm kind of relieved uh, the spring semester was an interesting trial run. We worked through a lot of, you know, um, it was a new experience on both end, right, for the students and for us. But um, I was really pleased at the end of it to say that we still were able to, you know, have a good connection with the students. We were able to assess the students um you know in the same way there's there's a, still a little bit of i'd say a disconnect in that you know when you're on the video you know you're looking at the the light on on your laptop and sometimes people are looking at you on the screen so that's a little clunky i think but for the most part um i was really relieved that it, it did go so well i think the students have adapted great and we're going to continue with that as well so pretty much the same as what lindsay said in terms of doing panels and um, virtual events, but we'll also be doing virtual interviews as well. Fantastic. 
Um, what I'm going to encourage you all as well is to continue to use that chat feature. You know, as questions come to mind, just, um, you know, chat them away. I'll stop and I'll ask um, our panelists as we go along. But thank you so much for sharing that. I would be interested if the educators want to um, maybe share with us some feedback in the chat feature that I can share out is, what did you hear from your students that may have experienced virtual interviewing um, over the past couple of months, any time from March to today, or you know their virtual internships, just so we can share the, the experience with everyone. Um, Kristen, why don't you, uh, I know we covered just a little bit, but maybe identify exactly, you know, has COVID, it sounds like COVID-19 has impacted the plan for recruiting. Um, and is there anything, and, and Lindsay, I, I asked this to you as well, um, you know, what other adjustments might you be making based on those impacts? Um, so when COVID-19 first hit and everything was basically shut down, you know, I would say everything came to a screeching halt for us. Um, all positions were put on hold. We were assessing, you know, are, are our clients going to still be in business? Are we still going to have the revenue? So we really took a, a big pause and have continued to assess that each month, looking at, you know, our revenues, our needs. So I would say we're still kind of in an assessment mode. So, um, but I would say that we're probably operating more conservatively than we have in the past because it is so touch and go, right? Like we thought the summer would be a piece of cake and then maybe there would be some issues in the fall. And now we're seeing, you know, things are spiking and we still don't even know what, you know, is really going to happen in the fall. So as a firm, we've been cautious and um, we are making plans, so we do plan to hire and things like that, but my expectation is it might be dialed back a bit than than normal. And I'll let Lindsay, you know, talk about her firm. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what um, Kristen just shared with you. I think if I had to project when we get to the fall, what we might see happen due to COVID-19 and the impact that it's had, is probably that there will still be firms out there, they're doing campus recruiting, they will probably hire less in October, November, and maybe do a second round of hiring in December or January, closer to when busy season starts, and they can actually see how their year ended, they can see if they lost any clients, audit clients, whatever it may be, going into 2021. I think that similar to what Kristen said about operating on a more conservative basis, I think we're all just watching each month as it goes and our businesses and their profitability and, and their likeliness to stay in business that I don't think you're going to see the same extremely aggressive approach that firms were taking over the past few years. I think you're going to see them dial that back a little bit, still higher, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see a second wind as it gets closer to January when firms have a better feel. You know, let's say you used to hire 10 entry level, maybe they go out and they hire seven or eight, and in January they hire the two more because they know they have the business. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw an approach like that. I, I know it's something I'm considering. I haven't made a decision on it yet, but definitely a, a strategy or approach that I'm considering. That's great to know, and thank you for sharing that. You know, um, before we move on to the next question, I just ask, and I'll be sure to stay in touch with the firms. Um, you know, if that if that transition or that um, addition happens, you know, it's definitely something that I would like to be able to support in terms of communication to the students. Um, you know, we typically, like I said, we're going to be hosting this virtual career fair in October. But what's not to say that, you know, if you're looking more towards the winter and you're finding that, um, you know, you have those positions to fill because of the, you know, the changes and, you know, the opportunities, why not host another event, you know, that we could, we could definitely help with. So um, that's really great to know. Thank you. So some of the questions coming in definitely um, relate very nicely to our next question, which is, if um, if you're interviewing and also networking virtually, what would you like students to know? Some of our educators are asking, um, you know, what would you recommend uh, that students do differently for the virtual event versus in person? One educator shared with us that one of his, their students lost an internship because the students um, or the the intern was wearing flannels. So. 
Um, Lindsay, why don't you share with us? Sure. Um, you know, sometimes you think certain things might be obvious, but I guess it's good to, to share some of those tidbits as well. You know, I think that some people feel that and the, the fear of being remote is that you're going to lose that personal interaction and you're going to lose that ability to create a rapport and build a relationship with the person on the other side of the screen. And I think that's a little bit false. Uh, and I think that has to do more with the fear of going remote. If we think about it, at least in mid-sized firms, remote used to be a last resort, not a first choice. And now, because we're going re remote, we're, I think we're all viewing it as more opportunity to do things that we weren't able to do before. So I think as that gear shifts, keeping in mind that you still have that same ability to build a relationship and rapport, and that you just need to make sure everything around your personality is buttoned up, meaning your desk space, that your camera is facing forward, that you're dressed appropriately, right, Felicia, I emailed you last night just to ask what the dress code was for today. So, you know, I think it's important that they don't lose sight and get too relaxed in those settings, um, making sure their cell phone is turned off, any background music that they might have been playing because they sit at their computer. I have a, a TV in my office and I keep that on all day, the news, whatever it may be, but obviously for a panel event, I shut it off. So this morning, similar to how if they were interviewing, I went through my workspace, I cleaned it up, I organized it, I shut off any background noises. I told my husband to take my daughter and the dog upstairs to get rid of that background noise. And I think that they just have to remember that, you know, when they used to come in person, they had to turn off their cell phones and, and things like that. So it's really just transitioning it to the remote environment and not losing sight and getting too relaxed. Those are the things that I would I would remind students of as they're going through the virtual environment. Great, thank you, Kristen. Yeah, I, I would reiterate a lot of that. Um, the things that I would add would be like one of the things that I did this morning was I because you can't I could have the trash guy show up today and you might be able to hear that or somebody might knock on my front door and you know I wasn't expecting that. So there is a degree of flexibility. I find people are a little bit more forgiving when those kind of things do happen. So that's good for the students to know, but then also to make sure that they try and preclude any of those issues from happening. Like I put a sign on my front door that just said in session, don't lock. You know, I don't know who might knock, but I'm just kind of covering all bases. Um, they should still have pen and paper, like still prepare as usual. They can take notes. Um, they, you know, probably need to practice this a little bit. Know that you need to project a little bit more when you're on a video than when you're sitting across the table from someone. Um, like Lindsay mentioned, you know, prep your location, make sure that there's good lighting, things like that. Um, it's, it's distracting when someone has a light behind them. Um, so maybe they can turn their table a little bit and, pre and prepare for that. So in the same way that you do a dry run for, a regular interview, you know, test the software that someone had sent you out. Um, make sure that that works. Um, I think, you know, all those things are going to help make it a little bit more relaxing. And um, again, we're flexible, we're all human, you know, somebody might go running through the background and that's, that's just gonna happen and that's okay. It might even make it kind of fun. <laughs> um, but, but I think they still need to take it as a professional interview and take it seriously. One of the, on some of the group events, um, I noticed, like there was a student, we hosted something in the summer, and a student didn't turn on his video for the whole event. Um, so I'm not sure why that was, um, but you know, if if you know you can't for some reason, send a, send a note beforehand and say, hey, my, I, know, I broke my computer and, and it doesn't have a video capability, but I'd still like to attend. I would have appreciated something like that as opposed to just saying, you know, well, John Smith just sat there and I have no idea if he was in the room or so. Um, keep in mind, we are still, you know, they're evaluating us, we're evaluating them. So, Alicia, just one thing to add. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Just one thing to add to what Kristen was saying um, in terms of, you know, there's distractions and we all have flexibility. I couldn't agree with that anymore. I think the key component is that they can't let themselves get flustered in those moments and lose track of 
whatever it was they were communicating. Sometimes I find that those distractions only make themselves flustered and yet the interviewer is completely fine with it. So just making sure that, um, you know, they can pull themselves back around and, and not let it, you know, tank their interview because they, uh, they got flustered. Those are some great recommendations and really great points, um, definitely for the educators to hear and listen to that, you know, something as simple as just sending a note in advance of, um, you know, why their camera might be off. Because I all, I think it's strange when, you know, especially uh, you're looking to interview in, you know, at a potential company, you want to see that person. Just like I think it's odd when there's not a LinkedIn profile picture, right? You want to see who you're looking at and dealing with. Um, and also a great reminder about that door sign. Kristen, I'm going to utilize that and, <laughs> and have, maybe I could put like a big shush sign everywhere. <laughs> but um, just so the educators, there are some questions. Dave, your question actually feeds into one of our questions below. So I'm going to hold off on that. I think there's going to be a lot of topic or conversation around that. We did have one question from an educator just asking um, if you could share with us what the landscape of what the firm is. Um, your, your work from home? Like, are you all still, the plan is to work from home? Are you looking to bring people back in person? Just so I guess the educators have a sense of what they could be sharing as well. Kristen, well, do why don't we wanna... start? Oh, okay, mm -hmm. I can take it. Um, so we are, we've been given the option. We have opened the office. People can choose to work in the office, but it's totally fine if they choose to stay at home. Um, so for those that want to go into the office, and we really didn't make it very attractive to go in the office because <laughs> of the implications of somebody passing something to someone else. So if so, we created A and B teams. The A team is in for two weeks, and then the B team comes in for two weeks, and the A team goes home for two weeks. So it's kind of a rotating. You do have to wear a mask when you're in the office, regardless of if you have a door or not none of the common areas are open like the kitchen um you're not allowed to have in-person meetings so it's really a, an option for those that i'd say maybe have a, a loud environment at home and weren't being able to be productive i personally i'm i'm content with staying working from home as long as there is, you know, until there's a vaccine, and that's pretty much what we'll be doing. I'd say the majority of our people are working from home, but there are a few that I think just, you know, they needed a quiet space, they're going in. Um, so if I wanna go into the office at this point, I have to go in either after six o'clock during the weekday, um, in which case, you know, I have to make an appointment, I have to get there, get my temperature checked, I call and I actually show that to someone on the HR team, um, or I can go in on the weekends. So it's really not a free for all. So Lindsay. we're pretty similar to Kristen. We opened our suburb offices about three or three, four weeks ago. Uh, we are planning on opening Philadelphia and New York City on August 3rd. Um, it is completely voluntary, um, similar to Kristen. We also, depending on the office size and the interest in people wanting to return and where they sit, depended on if we needed to implement an AB schedule. So in some of our offices, we have AB schedules and then in other offices, we don't. We opted for one week on, one week off. Um, it's gonna stay voluntary for quite some time. Uh, we do have some pretty strict requirements as well, not quite to uh, Kreischer Miller's level, but not, not far off. You have to wear a mask in all areas of the office unless you have a, an office with a door that shuts, then you then you don't. Um, and our common areas are open to be used, but not for congregating. So if you'd like to get a cup of coffee, you can, but no congregating. Um, and it requires a lot of certain like sanitation requirements and all of that. I don't anticipate that changing too soon, given the spikes in the rest of the country. Um, I think the concern about it coming back to our region is is real and um and so we're just watching and monitoring both both now our region but also the country as a whole uh whereas in the beginning we were primarily monitoring our region since it was high more highly impacted so for now all of our new hires who start start remote um and they will be on the same schedule as everybody else in terms of it being voluntary coming back 
We also are not allowing any visitors. And so all of our interviewing for any candidates are 100% remote as well. I would anticipate that our interviewing, whether campus or experienced hires, will remain remote for quite some time just because we're trying to reduce any unnecessary visitors into the space and really having it only be on a true business or emergency need. For example, our forensic practice who has a lot of court appointments and things like that, like they might have certain exceptions to on-site visitors. So I, I anticipate all of that staying remote for, for quite some time. And I think watching the colleges open and seeing how COVID impacts the colleges as they open, as some of the schools are doing, you know, the part on campus and, and part remote is going to be a big impact too, because for us as a firm, we have to remember if the students are on campus and they're getting exposed there and then they come into our office for an interview, it increases our employees' exposure. So it goes back to the point of just making sure that if it's not a necessary meeting to be done in person, if you can get a comparable experience remote, whether it's an interview or otherwise, we would just at this point prefer to keep it remote. Thank you so much, and I, I'm so glad to hear that. It's so interesting. Um, you know, Kristen, as you said, you made it, um, you know, lightly not attractive to be in the office, but, you know, as I, I talk about and we talk about, you know, going back and, you know, we just, everybody wants to be back together in the office, and I stop and I think, what does that really look like? You know, because we really can't be in the office together, right? You know, like we're not chit-chatting, we're not getting coffee together, you're not building those you know, those that foundational relationship to, you know, then translate that into, you know, your working relationship. So it is, it's interesting. And I think it will be an interesting to see how this core group of, you know, whether they're your interns or new hires, then how does this, you know, set their foundation and their expectations moving forward, you know, because we would be foolish to think that, what's happening right now and our ability to work from home so easily um, isn't going to have a lasting effect on, you know, what really, what does it mean to be in the office, um, you know, after we're past this kind of thing. But question for both of you, how would you feel, whether it be an intern or um, an experienced, um, you know, candidate, how would you feel about them asking very specifically about their, um, you know, having to be in the office, like what you are, what that expectation is like. Um, would you welcome that? Or how would that be viewed? Is that yeah, I'll start COVID this one. Goodbye. Look, is that once COVID is gone or? No, in this moment in time. Oh, I so think I can start with one. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, Lindsay, so go ahead. I, for me, I actually would welcome them asking those questions. I think it shows that they're keeping up with what's going on in the world and that they understand that things going on in our region and our country and the world impact a business. But I think that they have to ask it in a way that they're asking to understand how we're operating as a firm, what business decisions we're making to continue to be successful, to keep our employees safe, to keep our clients safe, and less so from they have a firm stance of what they want and they're allowed to have that firm stance. But in an interview, it should always be more probing questions to get an understanding and a feel how and why. And if and when you get to an offer stage and you have a strong feeling that you need to stay 100% remote, that's the time to really talk about that, in, in my opinion, that specific example. But I think in the interview, it's, it's a great opportunity to just ask those probing questions of how has COVID impacted your business? Have you kept your employees home? Are you gonna plan to keep them and get, giving them the option in the long run? Or at some point, are you going to require them to come back? I think there's a lot of really great questions that students can ask. And I wouldn't be surprised to, ask, to see employers in their interviews back to the students, ask them questions like, how did you manage your college classes during COVID? Were you remote? Did it impact your ability to work in teams in your classes. Like, I think there's gonna be a lot of really great interviewing questions that are behavioral based that can come out of COVID and the students should really be prepared for that. Oh, Lindsay, those are great. I hope all of you are taking terrific notes <laughs> because those are great points for the students to be aware of and know. Kristen, anything that you'd like to add to that? I don't really have much to add to that. I thought, Lindsay, you're right on. Um, I think it gives the students a great perspective from a you know, from the business perspective. They really haven't lived through anything like this before. Um, and 
a lot of times I don't think they even think about what are the implications when something like this happens. It's usually a central focus on, you know, how, this, how does this affect me as opposed to how does this affect the business and things like that. So, um, yeah, I'd I, I'm excited for some of the questions that might come out of this. Hopefully they're thinking like business owners. That's what we really look for them to do is to think, you know, big picture. Um, for us during this time, it was how do we keep everyone employed and not have to have layoffs? And, you know, like there were questions being asked of us and we're like, well, wait a minute, we're not committing to anything before we take care of our own first. And I, I remember during our summer leadership program, I had said to the students, you know, you're probably not even thinking of this yet, but I'm not a revenue generator at my firm. So, you know, if there's going to be someone who's kind of, you know, out the door, that could have been me. So I was very appreciative of the fact at, at how the firm um, addressed everything and kept everyone in, in the loop and, you know, had like a 10 point plan and, and walked through that. So I would be very impressed if students thought to ask those kind of questions. Um, you know, just to even like go back a little bit. And so how did how did the firm handle this? Because that's very telling on the culture of a, of a firm. And I think that's really what they're looking to assess when they're in an interview, right? Is, you know, did they keep everyone employed during this time? How did they handle it? Were they c communicating? We've had town halls every, you know, couple of weeks so that, you know, when you're remote, you feel disconnected. So how did people feel engaged? That kind of stuff. Those would be great questions. I didn't think I had anything to say, but I, apparently I did. <laughs> oh, I feel like I always have something to say. Thank you so much. But out of this, and I will share your contact information, I do have a faculty, a high school faculty member asking if either or both of you would be willing to be a guest speaker for an accounting class and um, also with their DECA students. So, you know, DECA students are students that are interested in business, business financing, entrepreneurship, as we were chatting about when we were prepping for this call, and really to talk to them about the industry um, and the expectations of what they could expect in an, in an interview. So if you're amenable to that, um, you know, maybe we could offer that as a resource to some others. I would love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, there you go. You're, I'm sure you're going to be booked up now. Um, <laughs> so we talk a lot about, and Dave, I know I am going to get to your question. Um, I would like to know from, and Lindsay, if you could kick us off with, you know, thinking about what courses schools and, and educators could build into their curriculum that they could offer to help the students transition from school, you know, from being a student to being um, a working individual and, uh, you know, being in that, in the work environment. Um, and I know that's not, we're not talking about technical skills. We're talking a little bit more about those transitional soft skills. Lindsay, what would you like to say? Yeah, absolutely. I think for, for years, I've kind of, I've kind of felt this way when the students come out of college and they have a very unstructured day in terms of what time their classes are, um, they really work on their own schedule. They know how they, when they have something due and they get it done by that time. Um, they may work in smaller teams for certain team projects, but they work with maybe the same team for the entire semester. And I, I find that, and it, some of this depends on what size firm you go to, I find that when they come into the firm, getting themselves onto that nine to five schedule or eight to six schedule, whatever the hours may be, is a real challenge. And I often find myself, um, coaching them on, listen, before you start work full time and you've been, you're coming off of college and you've been off all summer, you should probably start waking up at whatever time you're going to have to commute into work, maybe two weeks before. Really get yourself going so that the first day at orientation, you are, are bright eyed um, and ready to go. Because I've had them where, you know, they're falling asleep halfway through the day. I'd like to think it's not the material or the instructor, but you never know. Um, and that they're ready to go. But I also think having the ability to work with different personality styles, different management styles, um, people with different backgrounds is also extremely important. But I think the key component is that the classes that you would create around these subject areas are practical and not technical. 
So I don't think you can teach this, them this from a textbook. I think you need to come up with mock studies, case studies, where they're getting the same type of experience that they would be able to get if they were transitioning into the workplace, because I find that to be one of the harder areas for them. And then kind of separately, I don't think a lot of accounting majors really understand what the career trajectory is in public accounting and what skill sets are needed for the long term. So meaning a lot of times they only focus on the technical. Do they know how to audit cash? Do they know how to complete a 1040? But what it really is, by the time you're moving up to senior, it's supervising people, to manager, it's client interaction um, and being able to speak in layman terms. As you continue to advance further, it might be the fact that it's business development and it's sales. And that scares a lot of the employees. When, and, and a lot of my employees will say to you, when I went to college, I didn't know that I would be doing sales one day. And that's what business development is. And so I think they need to get a better picture of the long-term career in accounting in that it's both technical, it's soft skills, it's sales. Kristen earlier said entrepreneurship, being able to think like a business owner is so important. Um, and, and that's kind of what I feel is maybe lacking a little bit in the programs today. Kristen, how about you? I would agree with that. Um, I would say, again, like you were saying, like the practice sets, or I'm a big fan of role playing. Um, so if you can create some kind of class around having students practice with each other, um, that can be a painful exercise for people but it is really good practice. Um, it, even if it's, you know, they, they can practice doing the mock interviews, they can practice the art of conversation. I think with, every, with technology, while it's so great and quick and easy these days, students are so quick to shoot off a text instead of make a phone call and, and have an actual conversation. So I, I've, I, I say to my niece and nephew all the time, like you really need to practice the art of conversation, how you start a conversation, how you keep it going. So, and, and that isn't something that I think is hard to do, but it does require practice to do it naturally. Um, from a the only technical area I would say that I, I could see continued need for continued development would be with Excel skills. Um, so maybe taking an advanced Excel course something like that um, we do find we have our own internal excel program because we find they come in with the basics but they're not necessarily at the point where they know macros and pivot tables and things like that and we are using that on our audits so um that would be the only technical thing that i think could use a little refining um and then actually i would say a, a writing class i know that you know it's an an accounting profession, but we actually write a lot. And so that will help them um, as they continue to develop in their careers. Initially, it might be just a work paper comment, but down the road, it could be writing an article, writing a blog, those kind of things, writing a proposal, um, doing a business case. Um, if you have a new idea and you want to present it to the board, you're going to have to, you know, work on your your writing skills so those would be things i would say in addition to um all the wonderful things that lindsay was talking about so let me ask you both um because i know that the it's a burning question in the educators minds and one that we talked about a lot today and something that they will be talking a lot about as the cpa evolution um marches forward in the timeline. So I heard what you said um, about what's important. So my question to you is, what would you like to see? A candidate that is better at the transition from school, you know, from being in school to being, um, you know, in the working world, or a candidate that is prepared to take ready and pass the exam? Because I do know that the educators, they're probably thinking to themselves, well, geez, you know, they're really charged with, you know, helping to create a finished product, you know, someone that's ready to come out and, and you know, not have the distraction of um, needing to maybe study constantly for the exam. You know, they can start that process, obviously, when they've graduated, but, you know, having the knowledge and maybe being able to do it quickly and turn it around quickly, you know, so... Um, or is it, or is it a blend of the of the two worlds for for the, the ideal candidate? I'll just open it up, Kristen. 
I, I kind of want it all. So, <laughs> you know, so the, the candidate that can do the, all of that, you know, that is ready to take the exam or is well prepared and can and has a plan in place and can have a conversation, they're going to outshine the rest of their peers. So it, I, I don't think one is more valuable than the other. I think both take an investment of time. So I don't. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a tough call. I can't say it's an either or, but I would say you know the more that some the more of that both of them that someone has, the more they're going to rise to the top of the the selection list. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, blended is always preferred. Um, you know, when we talk about becoming a partner in the firm, we talk about somebody who has a well-rounded technical skill set, so that they're not putting the firm at risk or liability, but then we talk about all the soft skills, mentorship, leadership, client development, business development, all of those components. And that doesn't just turn on one day when they become a partner. That's a skill set that's um, built over time, some built and some innate for some people. Um, so of course the blended is, is preferred. I think if you really wanted to force me to, to say one over the other, I think it's easier to help the person get their CPA than to teach them the transition and the soft skills. So in my personal opinion, I would rather have somebody who's invested in the firm, wants to become a partner, has all those soft skills, um, and then I can, I can help them get to the CPA. I'll, I'll just give you some examples at our firm. We have some people like that who advance. So in our firm, you can get to manager without your CPA and you can't get beyond that. And I know some firms have earlier restrictions than ours. We've had several managers who are superstars. Like they are, they are partners, like you would know in the first conversation that you had with them, but they never passed their CPA for whatever reason. They failed the first couple of times, they got demotivated, what, whatever, whatever the reason may be. What we've built is a program that helps them take the time off without using their personal PTO, get condensed study time, we pay for any extra materials or study that they need, and then they end up passing the exam in, in most of them in 12 to 15 months because they also have this like renewed motivation and dedication because they have a certain level of professional maturity by the time they become that manager level and they understand the importance and significance of it. Whereas I feel like if you were to flip it the other way and you have the person who's like 100% dedicated to the CPA but doesn't have some of those other skills that you need, those other skills might be more difficult to teach. Not impossible, but more difficult. So I agree with Kristen. I prefer the blended, but I, I feel like if you wanted an answer on picking one or the other, that, that would be my, my preference. No, that's really great feedback. Um, and again, so important for this audience to hear and myself as well, you know, when I'm talking to students all the time. So um, and it, I think that's definitely a shift of what I've heard. And I know that doesn't, um, it doesn't transcend across all sectors. You know, I know that, you know, for different firms think, you know, might look differently, but um, it's not one that I don't think is going to be a little bit more common than not. So moving on, you know, staying in that realm, um, you know, students have to get the, the 150 credit hours. And we all know that in order to sit for the exam, what they need to get um, and, you know, to get their license, they have to have, you know, a total of 36 credit hours in accounting related subjects. But I'm asking you as a, as a firm and company, do you have a preference of what students get the additional credits in to reach the overall 150? Lindsay. So I get this question a lot when I'm at career fairs or doing other events with students, especially um, like the junior level where they're starting to really think about what it is they want to do and do they want to take on the cost of another master's of a master's program or or do they want to get an extra year of work experience and start immediately? You know, at our firm, we have never been specific as to the type of degree that it should be. However, if they got a bachelor's in accounting, we do prefer it to then be in another specialty area. So a master's in tax to make them more well-rounded um, or other business areas that make them um, stronger business, uh, to have a stronger business mindset. So rather than a master's in accounting, um, we prefer them to focus on another area, but still within the business realm. We find the master's in accounting program very beneficial for those who are actually doing a career change. So maybe, you know, they, maybe they started in human resources and now they want to become an accountant. Then, of course, the master's in accounting program is very beneficial for them. 
Kristen. Similarly, um, we don't really have a requirement as to how they get the 150. So whether it's um, going through a MAC program or, you know, manipulating your schedule so that you can get 150 credits, you know, with your bachelor's, um, maybe adding an extra major or something like that. Um, it really depends on the person. I know students ask us a lot if we have a preference. Some students don't have the financial wherewithal to pay for a MAC program. So if they can do it cheaper, you know, go to community college, take some online classes. Um, I think at some schools, you know, they can take six classes for the same price as five classes. I, I, we really don't care how they get it done. Um, my preference would be that they're not just taking fluff classes. Um, try, like Lindsay said, like try and think about, you know, where you want your career to go and, and add some, some flavor to the accounting um, classes that you already have. And I think that will broaden their perspective a lot too. Um, I, I think some of the MAC programs are fantastic, but I don't necessarily know that they need all the extra advanced accounting classes. Um, I'd love to see a little bit more variety in there. Again, I'm a big fan of the writing class. Um, we will be teaching them all the technical skills that they need going forward. So, you know, even even some culture would be great. But, so, um, but however they want to get it. It's, we do require that they have the 150 before they start with us. Um, the reason being that sometimes they still need to pass the exam. So we just want them focusing on one thing at a time. Okay. Well, I think I'm just going to um, ask this one question so I don't lose sight of it, uh, just because it relates a little bit to um, our virtual world. Joe Hargadon from Widener is asking, how will internships and co-op opportunities be impacted under COVID-19 in a virtual setting? And um, I'm thinking he's, and Joe, chime in <laughs> um, I, if I'm incorrect in your interpreting this, but I think he's referring to, you know, the credits, how's that going to work? Any experience with that this past year or what you all are thinking, Kristen? We were still able to, we kept all of our interns on throughout, through the end of busy season. So our internship is during the spring semester and it's full time. So we were able to keep them productive. Um, I, I just see it instead of while they were able to train in the office and be in the office physically for a little while, I really don't see it having much impact on the type of work that they'll do be doing or anything like that it'll just be done in a remote environment and we're adapting to make sure that you know it is harder to it's easier to ask a question when you're sitting right next to your senior uh then you know sometimes i think they felt like they were interrupting if they would make a phone call and things like that so we're working on communicating that if you have a question, ask a question and making sure the seniors are checking in with them a little bit more than they normally would because they're not sitting right next to them. But um, I just see, you know, the training will be virtual instead of in a classroom. Um, they will still be assigned, whether they're in audit or tax client work. And um, it might be a little slower with the review, just again, because you're not physically next to someone, but I, I don't see it impacting the structure, the way it's set up at all. Yeah, just to add to that. So um, I think it really differentiates on when the on when the internship is. So I think I would anticipate that busy season internships will be comparable to how the experience will be comparable to how they have been in the past, um, whether remote or in person. Um, I also think that there, there, there may be an opportunity for more internships in busy season because if more work comes in than we were anticipating, it may be easier to fill those um, open gaps in our schedules with interns than getting staff associates at the last minute if there are none available. So I think it could end up working in their favor potentially, depending on how business goes. I think that, um, and what I've seen at our firm for internships in the summer and what I've seen at firms that I've spoken to across the board is that most firms for summer 2020 completely changed their internship program. Um, some um, uh, removed it completely and paid the students a stipend. Um, others just consolidated it down to one or two days. 
at Friedman, we decided to consolidate it from uh, eight weeks to four weeks. And in those four weeks, we our goal is to get them at least one or two um, real life experiences working on an audit engagement or tax engagement, depending on what the work is that they're assigned to. And then around that, more around the business of accounting, building relationships with people and such. So we tried to keep it as practical for them as possible so that they wouldn't lose that experience. I don't anticipate that happening in future summers because I think we'll have a better handle around how COVID impacts the business next summer than you know, when COVID really hit hard here in March and we had to make quick decisions. There wasn't as much time to plan for it. So I think all the firms did the best that they could, but I don't think it will have the same impact. If anything, I think some of the really great things that we've added in this summer will only enhance the program in the future. So I think that it depends on when the internship is, will depend on the on if it's impacted or not. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. So knowing that we have on the call with us both college educators and a few high school educators, you should know, because um, you know, they're they're so passionate about sharing the information with their students who are taking accounting and really are the future of the profession, that they join up. They joined us today as they do um in most other times when we're in person. So knowing that from a company's perspective, what what can faculty do to help you this fall? You know, knowing that it's not a typical year or season, um, you know, what, what are some things that they can do um, for you all? Kristen. That's a good question. Um, I think that there are going to be limited, maybe some more limited touch points for us with the students. Um, you know, we're not gonna be able to, show up on campus with and have a table for an afternoon and interact with the students. So if there's if if there's any ideas on what we can do for, you know, so just some casual touch points. Um, I know that speaking in the classes is, is, is easy to continue to do, whether you're there in person or just jumping into um, a classroom via video or virtual. Um, so if the professors are open to having us do like a little five minute commercial or maybe have a guest speaker on a specific accounting topic or not even not an accounting topic. Um, I, I just feel like we're, I, I feel like we're gonna have less touch points with the students um, than when you're in a live scenario. Um, and then I would also offer you know, one thing back to the professors and the and the high school educators. I have a nephew that's a high school senior, and again, a lot of internships and jobs were canceled this year, and there's a lot of nervousness about how do I show what I was doing. And so we've been brainstorming, and I think just taking any kind of initiative would be helpful. Like I recommended to my nephew, you between your parents and everyone, you've got access to all these professionals. So pick 10 of them and interview them this summer because as you're trying to figure out what you, look, he may not even know if he wants, you know, which kind of business class he wants or major he wants. So start interviewing professionals to get an idea of what they're doing and how that relates to your interests because at least you're doing some of that work ahead of time and you're showing us that you took the initiative to do something as opposed to you know sleeping in till noon so um that would just be one suggestion i would give back to the professors or high school educators um just jumping off from the original question so just to build off of, yeah just to build off of what kristen um was speaking to I think it really comes down to being more intentional about our touch points and we can't rely on big events anymore. Um, so we have to we have to make some more intentional efforts to get in front of the students this year. And again, this might be this may end up turning out to be something where we come up with all these great ideas that we use in years going forward and not just because we're remote this year. So what I would really like to see is beyond the um the career fairs and the class presentations or the accounting society presentations i would really love to see the school identify 
ways for the employers to interact with the students in smaller group settings where it actually creates the opportunity to develop a relationship with the students and less around um, you know, events where we're just speaking and they're listening, but no relationship is developed. So whether it's creating a topic and it's five people at a time from this from the class, and maybe you run three concurrently if there's 15 people in the class. I know there's more than that. I'm just giving an example. Um, but I think that there's probably a really good way to do smaller breakout um, interactive sessions with the students. And I think that will help with the limited um, interactions that we're not going to be getting from career fairs and such. Fantastic. I'm just going to pop over and see if we have um, any additional questions. I did have one question come up and I figured we could, you know, open this up for just open ended questions. Um, is I have a high school educator and I know that you know, it's sometimes so easy to just say, oh, make them do it. But she's really experiencing and, you know, the high school educators are seeing the beginning of the pipeline, so to speak. And, you know, she's hearing what we're saying about the soft skills um, and how important it is to start that conversation with the students now about the importance of talking and generating conversations and not just texting. Um, but she's just sharing that you know, that's all they, they want to do is, you know, text rather than talk. But, you know, again, I think it's, um you know, we as a society have to recognize that and, and adjust where we can. And, um, you know, who's who's to say that somehow, you know, I don't, I don't know, texting becomes the next virtual w remote working from home. But it's, it's interesting to see that. But I'd be curious to see from, um, you know, Kristen and Lindsay, you know, how do you address some of those things, um, you know, not just the softer skills, but the texting and also wearing, you know, the, the ear pods all the time, you know, are there certain things that you, um, you know, advise new hires, you know, when you have them come in, you know, do they go through some sort of training on reminding them the do's and the don'ts of technology? We do have a class that we put them through um, in the first week or second week of training. Um, I kind of feel like the texting is, you know, what the email was for us when when email first came in and you would shoot off an email and it was like, well, don't just shoot off this email. Um, and don't get me wrong, I communicate with a lot of people through text, but you still always have to keep in mind the impression that you're leaving someone with so um you know if it's just a confirmation of a time then i would be fine with a quick answer but if i'm looking to engage in a dialogue then you know the yes no doesn't really create that connection um same thing with the earbuds i know that that's a common thing for young people i i can't multitask like that so um so luckily i don't have to worry about that personally. But um, again, just remember the image that you're leaving. So if you're at a client location and they're paying a lot of money for you to be there, you need to be respectful that you're not appearing as if you're not paying attention or you're, you're you know, you're just having your own little party, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's all about perception, whether it's over text in person like they th that's i think the overall awareness that we're hoping that they're getting it is okay to text someone and again i know that's sometimes the easiest way to catch somebody right um so it is okay it's just they have to be mindful of the presentation and the perception on the other end yeah i feel like there can be an entire panel on this topic um so I, I also feel texting is okay in the right moments, um, to Kristen's point. But I don't. What I don't think that the students understand is the difference in texting a friend and texting an employer or a peer from work. You know, you have to remember um, to be professional in those scenarios, even if you're using text as your method of communication. But back to, to, to the person's question about how, how do you get the students to really understand the importance of the soft skills like, like art of conversation, I think anytime we tell a student that they have to do something, the, all they're gonna do is not do that because that's not what they wanna hear. 
I think you just have to put them in those in those circumstances. So I think coming up with um, real life experiences for them during a class is a great way to do it. So, you know, I'm just brainstorming off the top of my head here. This is not something I had pre-planned. Um, so you can take it and, and, and run with it if you want, or you can squash it if you don't like it. But I think identifying um, professionals in the workplace who can spare an hour and putting them in front of that professional, taking their cell phone away and saying, here, have a conversation and let them see how difficult that really is, but then explain to them the importance of why why it is so important. And I think giving them those, those actual tangible experiences are gonna be the only way where you're gonna be able to show them the importance of it, rather than putting it up on a PowerPoint and just explaining the importance. And I think, you know, as I'm brainstorming here, even as an employer, I could probably institute something like that in my new hire onboarding for entry levels around client interaction and put them in front of like a fake client and say, okay, now how are you going to interact with that client? How are you going to ask for open items lists? And how are you gonna push back if they say they gave it to you and they didn't? And all those scenarios that we know that come up, I don't think you have to get that granular um, with high school students or even early college students, but I do think that you still can put them in those role playing scenarios, but you have to take away the crutches like the cell phone, like it has to be a no cell phone class or you know, you put it in a bucket when you enter the class. It's almost like speed dating for professionals. <laughs> I just want to thank you um, both very much. I hope to bring these two groups together. Um, again, you know, the educators and, and our firm representatives, I think it's so very important, especially as, you know, our world will continue to change, not just from the curriculum perspective, but just in general and how we're working and what the working world looks like. So thank you so very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for attending. Like I said, it was um, such a pleasure and a joy to experience this new platform with you all. You're all so very engaging. Um, you may not have heard me say this, or maybe you have, but you guys set a record for the number of chat questions that came in when Mike was presenting. So um, I'm sure we will be bragging about you all for a very long time. I want to announce that our um, winner of the $25 Amazon gift card is Sharon Turchik. So if you could please go back and visit um, our Welcome Squad booth and visit with Kristen so you can redeem that, that would be amazing. Um, be on the lookout for the survey for today's conference. I'd like to know, um, you know what you thought of it, what we can do better, how we can plan for next year. A few things I just want to make sure that you're aware of. Um, actually, as of last night, I got confirmation that on August 13th, we will be hosting a Zoom one-hour CPE um, course with NASDA's COO, Colleen Conrad. She will be sharing with us um, the exposure draft on the on model education rules. Um, and that exposure draft is open through August 31st. Also, COVID impacts on state boards, CPA exam candidates, firms, et cetera. I know that that's, um, you know, Mike talked a little bit about it today. I know that as educators, you see and hear things from your recent grads. So definitely want to be able to give you the opportunity to hear from her and then talk with her and share your, your feedback and what you're hearing from, um, from students. And lastly, save the date for our hope to be in-person conference next year in Hershey on July 21st, 2020. Um, I did that so we couldn't forget the date of 2121. Um, I hope I said that right, right? July 21st, 2021. Thank you all very much, and I hope you have a terrific rest of your day. <laughs>